Good evening. evening. And welcome to worship with us here at Christ Evangelical Lutheran Church on this Maundy Thursday evening. For the most part, our service this evening follows setting two of the order of service found in our hymnals on page 172. The outline of our service is on the purple sheet that you received as you entered this evening. We will omit the singing of a couple of the songs of the liturgy. We will omit the Kyrie and Gloria and also the gospel acclamation verse, but I'll remind you of those as we get to those. Our service will begin this evening with our opening hymn, number 416, When You Awoke That Thursday Morning. May God bless us and be with us this evening.
Please stand. We turn to page 172. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for the sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The congregation may be seated. For our first scripture reading on this Maundy Thursday evening, we turn to the book of Exodus to chapter 12, verses 20, 21 through 30. In these verses, we hear the Lord's instructions passed down through Moses to his people to celebrate the Passover, to mark their houses with the blood of the Lamb that would save them from death. <clears throat> we read from Exodus chapter 12, beginning at verse 21. Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. Not one of you shall go out the door of his house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your house and strike you down. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshipped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. The word of the Lord. We'll continue now with the psalm of the day, which is Psalm 116. We'll find that in the early pages of our hymnal, and we'll join together to sing that psalm in unison, Psalm 116.
Our second reading this morning, this evening, is just two short verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In these two verses, verses 16 and 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul reminds us of the great unity we share when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, that our Lord has brought us together as his people to share in his body and blood. We read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The word of the Lord. Please stand for our gospel reading. <clears throat> our gospel lesson this evening will also serve as the basis for our sermon. It comes from Luke's gospel in the 22nd chapter, beginning at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The Gospel of our Lord. The congregation may be seated and we will continue, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll continue with the hymn of the day, number 526.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Outside the walls of an upper room in Jerusalem, the enemies of Jesus are getting ready. The chief priests, the teachers of the law, they've wanted Jesus dead for quite a while. Their desire to eliminate him only seems to grow as his popularity has grown over the last few years. His recent triumphal entry into Jerusalem is kind of the icing on the cake and pushed them over to the edge and added urgency to their cause and made them certain that he had to go. But they hadn't been able to do anything about it. They hadn't been able to act on their desire to kill this man because there were so many people around him. It was the Passover festival. Jerusalem was bursting at the seams with visitors there to celebrate. Jesus was spending his time throughout that whole week out in public, teaching and preaching in the temple courts where he could easily be found. But finally, the Jewish leaders get their angle. Finally, they get their inside man that they needed. They convince Judas to betray his friend and his Savior. So on that Thursday evening, while Jesus was gathered in that upper room with his inner circle of disciples, outside those walls, the leaders were plotting his death. And soon, their plan would come to a head. Both their plan and God's plan. So the 24 hours that exist between sundown on Thursday of Holy Week and sundown of Friday on Holy Week are an absolute whirlwind of action. The mob arrests Jesus in Gethsemane Thursday evening. There's the trials before Annas and Caiaphas and Pilate and Herod and back to Pilate. There's the agonizing walk to the place of the skull, to Calvary. There's the crucifixion, death, and lastly, burial in a borrowed tomb. But not quite yet. Not here. Not for a few hours. In this rented upper room, it's just Jesus and his disciples. And oh, how he has longed for this moment, he says. How much I've yearned to eat this meal with you, he tells his followers. This is what he's been looking forward to. This time with his disciples is precious to him. As their brother in the flesh, Jesus loves to be with his family, with God's family. During his ministry, we hear about countless times where he looked for time to go away with just his disciples, to be with just his close group of friends. We hear about his visits to Bethany, to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. A little later this Thursday evening, Jesus is going to go to one of his favorite places to go with his disciples, to the Mount of Olives, specifically the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's going to ask a small group of his friends to come with him, to pray with him, to watch and pray. In fact, he does more than, than ask. He insists that they follow him. He insists that they come and that they watch and pray so that they don't fall into temptation. And he's so disappointed when they can't. Outside this upper room on Thursday evening, Jesus knows what lies in wait. His enemies, everywhere. At every turn, at every corner, a trap has been set. They're waiting, waiting for their chance to seize him. But inside that upper room on Thursday evening, Jesus is with his disciples, with his friends, the ones he loves the most, even though the one who will betray him is there in that room, he's with family. 
It's more than that, though, of course. It's more than just a friendly get-together. Jesus and his disciples aren't just hanging out there. They've gathered for a purpose, to celebrate the Passover, to remember the night when God rescued them from death, when he rescued their ancestors from slavery in Egypt. We heard about that in our first lesson this evening. God had promised that he would strike down the firstborn in every house in Egypt, both human and animal alike, unless they had been marked with the blood of a lamb, unless they had followed the instructions God passed down to Moses and Aaron to slaughter a year-old lamb without blemish or defect and paint some of its blood on the tops and sides of the door frames of their houses, Then the angel of death would pass over that house. And to celebrate that event, to commemorate it as a lasting ordinance like God told the Israelites to, that's why Jesus has gathered with his disciples in this upper room on this Thursday evening. To remember the night that destruction came to Egypt. But by grace and mercy, the Israelites were rescued. Inside their homes, gathered with their families, they were protected by the blood of the Lamb as they gathered around this special meal that God had told them to celebrate. There, in their homes, God's people were safe. And the Lord led them out of Egypt and led them out of slavery. Every year, God's people were to celebrate that meal And it wasn't just a chance to remember all that God had done for his people, but that lamb pointed forward. It pointed to the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. To Christ. To the one who would be sacrificed for his people. To the one whose blood would protect God's people from the wrath of sin. It pointed forward to the one who would give them freedom from slavery. Slavery to sin and death. And set them free to live. On this Thursday evening that we hear about in Luke chapter 22, this meal had been celebrated for well over a thousand years already. But that year was unique. This Thursday evening where this meal is celebrated in Luke chapter 22 is unique because the Lamb of God is there in the flesh. There to celebrate with his people. And even so, even though all of that is going on, we haven't even mentioned the best part of this evening yet. And that's what Jesus does for his disciples that evening. He shows them the the ultimate act of service and love as he gets down to wash their feet. He gives them a new command to love one another. And then he gives them himself. He doesn't uh, introduce a new twist on something old. He's not changing the tradition for them to practice something slightly different. He's showing them the fulfillment of this thing that has been celebrated for over a thousand years. He's showing them that he is the fulfillment and that now he gives something new to replace it. On this night, for the first time, Jesus gives his body and his blood to his disciples, to his people. He gives the very same thing he'll give in full the next day on the cross. On that night, he gives a down payment on the new covenant. A covenant made in his blood. A pact made with God and sinners which God alone upholds. In this room, Jesus institutes a meal that will be celebrated not just once a year to commemorate a specific event, but a sacrament that will be celebrated whenever and as often as the faithful followers of God desire it. Jesus knows what exists outside that room that evening. 
And in this meal that he gives his disciples, he gives them something to strengthen them for what's ahead. To strengthen their faith for the dreadful things they're about to see and experience. To strengthen them for the work that they will be asked to do now for the rest of their lives. Right at that moment, when Jesus' enemies are everywhere, when the trap is set, ready to be sprung, ready to seize him at any time, the people of the world have risen up to put God on trial, have accused him of crimes that he did not commit, and stand in judgment over him. Christ gives a gift of peace and mercy. Right now, as we sit here this evening, the enemies of God are everywhere. They surround us. The people of the world rise up to accuse God. They stand in judgment over the gifts that he gives. They ridicule the words he has given to us. They conspire to prevent those words from having an impact on our world, on our culture, even on our children. The enemies of God that surround us judge us to be out of touch. They're happy to exclude us. They're happy to to push us to the fringes, to see us fade away. Worst of all, our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion, waiting for someone to devour. All around us is hostility. All around us, forces of evil lurk and conspire against us which is why it is so good for us to be here. To be together. To be right here in in this room, in God's house. With Him and with each other. With God's people. With our people. Not that we don't bring sin in here with us, too. The doors at the entry aren't some sort of airlock that prevents sin from entering in. We drag in our imperfections, our doubts, our worries, just like Judas brought his sins into that upper room as well. Sin wasn't absent there for sure. The disciples who dined at the table with Jesus, including the one who would betray him, brought sin in with them. But that's just why we need to be here, isn't it? The fact that we bring sin with us everywhere we go is all the more reason that we need to be here in this room with our Lord. Here Jesus gathers us together to assure us that his blood covers us, that his blood shields us from God's wrath. He reminds us that the kingdom of God belongs to him and not to his enemies that he has perfect control over all the events of this world and power over even the strongest of our enemies. When you hear God's word here, you hear it as if it were Jesus speaking to you, speaking to your hearts, just as if he was sitting across the table from you. But he doesn't just speak across the table to you. He invites you to sit with him at the table. He gives you himself, the very body that he took on when he came into this world. He gives to us the body in which he served his father perfectly, the body he gave into death on the cross. He gives you the blood that he shed, the blood that established a new covenant, a covenant not like the old one from the Old Testament, a covenant not sealed in the blood of sacrifices that you have to bring but a covenant sealed in the blood of Christ. A covenant that he alone upholds as your true and only Savior. Tonight, Jesus gives you this invitation. He says, come, be with him. He says to you, oh, how I've longed to be with you. Come, sit at my table. Celebrate this meal with me. Everything's ready, he tells us. There's nothing more you need to do. Come, he says. Take and eat. Because this is my body, he tells you. 
Come, take and drink. This is my blood given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Let your enemies rage out there. Let them do what they will. But here, in this moment, at this table, as we gather together, as we stand shoulder to shoulder, it's just us and our Savior brought here for a special purpose, to be with Him. And it's not just each of you individually, but it's us together. We enjoy communion with one another. We, we share in that one loaf that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 10, that we participate in this same thing together because we are united in Christ. To your right and to your left as you stand at the Lord's table are your brothers and sisters in Christ. They're the ones fighting alongside you, facing the same enemies you face, needing the same strength, the same forgiveness that you need. Jesus eagerly looked forward to the time when he could be with his people. And we should too, because it's special. Throughout our midweek services, the last several weeks, we've been talking about God being on trial and how the life of a Christian very much feels like we're being put on trial at times. Well, if our lives are like a courtroom where the world puts us and our Lord on trial, then think of the Lord's Supper like a recess, a break in the trial, a respite, away from the accusations, in a quiet room where there are no prosecutors, No jury judging you, only the promise of a victorious outcome. How eagerly should we desire to eat this meal which our Lord offers us? Because here is where we find peace. Here is where we stand in the presence of God. Here is where we stand surrounded by God's people. Here is your little foretaste of heaven to bolster you, to strengthen you, to go back out into battle until your Savior comes in glory. So come and share this meal with your Savior and with one another. And may it strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. Please stand. We turn now to page 180 in our order of service, and we'll join together in confessing our faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven. At the right hand of the Father, he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, (coughs) is from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The congregation may be seated for the prayer of the church.
Dearest Jesus, you are the true Passover lamb who was slain for us. Your body was offered for us. Your blood spares us from death. As Israel celebrated their freedom in the Passover, we celebrate our freedom in you. Your body and blood were given and poured out for us for the forgiveness of sins. As we partake of your body and blood, draw draw us together as one body in faith. Strengthen our faith in you. Increase our love for one another. Lord Jesus, you displayed your love for your disciples by giving them your body and blood for the forgiveness of sins. Forgive our sins and fill us with hope as we look to the day when we will eat and drink with you in the kingdom of God. Let this holy supper bring your healing and rest to those who are weary and burdened by sin, guilt, and the troubles of this world. Cheer us with your real presence. Pardon us with your declaration of forgiveness. Unite us to yourself and to one another. And, O Lord, O great physician, remember those who suffer in body as well. We ask that you especially be with the father of our sister in faith, Lisa Panitsky, who is nearing the end of his battle with cancer. We ask that you grant Lisa and her father comfort in these days. Remind them of your love and the hope of salvation through you. Remind them of the forgiveness that exists because you have given your body and blood to take away the sin of the world. And because that sin has been removed, the gates of heaven are open to all who believe in you. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise and thank you for the grace that you established this supper in which we eat your body and drink your blood. By your Holy Spirit, help us to use this gift worthily to confess and forsake our sins to confidently believe that we are forgiven in you, and to grow in faith and love day by day until we come at last to the joyful eternal salvation. You live and reign there now and forever. Amen. At this time we'll gather our offering. Please stand. We turn to the service of the sacrament on page 183. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Lord God, you are worthy to receive thanks and praise from all people. You created the world and all who live in it, and in your mercy, you saved us. We give thanks to you for the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Though in very nature God, he took the nature of a servant and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. He offered himself as a sacrifice for sin and redeemed us from its curse and penalty. He rescued us from the terrors of death and restored eternal life with you. He conquered our enemies and gained for us the kingdom of grace and glory. Bless us as we receive your Son's body and blood and lead us to remember his suffering, death, and resurrection. Forgive our sins and fill us with the hope of new life in heaven. Hear our praise and receive our thanks as we worship you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat the body of Christ given for the forgiveness of sins. And also take and drink the blood of Christ shed for the remission of all your sins. Now go at peace with your Lord, for your sins are forgiven. Amen.
Please stand. We'll join in the responsive words of thanksgiving on page 187. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. <clears throat> Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet you have given us in this sacrament. Through this gift you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The congregation may be seated for our closing hymn this evening, number 422. 